So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Eileen Mahoney. I know almost all of you, and if I don't know you in person, I've seen you on a gathering or two. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and first of all, I want to thank One Spirit just for making this possible. Um, this was an idea that came out of a need um, for people to connect around the pandemic. And I think it was a great idea and I hope it continues. Um, and I want to thank David Renata for doing such a great job in the technology. I believe me, I wouldn't be here without him, nor would any of you. So <laughs> thank you, David. It's really wonderful. Um, and I want to welcome everybody. Um, there are some friends of mine from my class. I just graduated from One Spirit this past spring. So it's wonderful to see them. And there's some family members and some friends. So I want to welcome you all. It's kind of like having a, part, a virtual party for me, really. It's really very sweet. So thank you. There's Richie Pryor from Florida with that beautiful sunset behind him. He's pretty far away. Um, he's a dear friend. So anyway, it's wonderful to see you all. And um, thank you for being attracted to the um, title of No Mud, No Lotus. I, I'd love to claim claim it as an original thought, but it is not. It is work by Thich Nhat Hanh, a um, Vietnamese Zen master who was really trying to distill the essence of Buddhism, I guess. And um, actually the way the, that phrase came about was that he was writing about suffering and joy, and he couldn't figure out exactly how to capture it for the Western mind. So he asked one of his students and she came up with the phrase, no mud, no lotus. So that, that was how that phrase got born. And it is a wonderful book. In case you haven't seen it, um, I highly recommend it. Hi, Kate. Um, so I will really be working from that and also from my own experience with that. And I've had the the gift really of working with it with other groups as well. And um, I've just found it to be a really very rich, simple yet profound, I don't want to use the word process because it sounds like another thing, but it is a process. Um, but it's a very rich way of, of working with our suffering. And um, one of the things I love about it is that the word art attracted me. I'm also an expressive arts therapist. and the art of suffering, that phrase really intrigued me because um, I thought of suffering as nothing but dread and I don't know, I can't even think of another word other than dread. <laughs> but um, he was talking about the art of suffering. And then as I, as I worked with this, I learned that the art of suffering is also the art of happiness. So, um, and it is an art form and like anything, it does require skill and it requires some practice. So this evening, let me tell you a little bit about what we'll be up to. Um, I'll talk a little bit about no mud, no lotus and what that might mean for each of us and collectively. And then we'll experiment with an experience of meditation and sort of stepping into a little bit of that. Hi, Aaron. Um, and then, um, and then we'll share, um, spend some time sharing our experience and how that was for each of us. And since there are so few of us this evening, I think maybe we could just share in this group and not break out into breakout rooms. Um, initially I thought we might break into smaller rooms, but I think we can all share, share. This would be lovely. So, um. So we'll begin with one of the tools actually <clears throat> for mindfulness and for managing our suffering, which is a bell. The sound of the bell is an ancient, ancient tool that people use really to remind themselves to come back to their breath and home to themselves. So I would invite you to just sit up straight in a relaxed way and just notice the sound of the bell. Let your breath resonate with each sound. I'll invite it three times. And I use the word invite um, advisedly because as we invite the sound of the bell, we invite ourselves to come home to ourselves and home to your true self, not just the self that does your everyday tasks. So, 
And after we hear the sound of the bell, we'll hear a song that um, I think will sort of set the stage and at least articulate some of our experience sometimes with times when we try to become mindful. Open my eyes this morning with a head full of rot. There wasn't even half a space for any decent thought. So I chased myself around a while and I began to see. It's trouble when you take yourself too seriously. And too much thinking is bound to make you crazy. Give your stomach trouble. Make your vision hazy Won't somebody tell me how to turn off this brain The journey would be quiet and I'd get there just the same So I went out to take a walk, you know, really get it straight Nature's voice is getting lost in this endless debate there's choruses of demons They begin to cheer Oh, choirs of angels But they begin to sneer Cause too much thinking Is bound to make you crazy Give your stomach trouble Make your vision hazy Won't somebody tell me how to turn off this brain The journey would be quiet And I'd get there just the same it figured out it turned itself around I just stand and scratch my head as it turns me upside down so I circle back the other way to get another point of view with my maturity prevailing and nothing left to do oh, too much thinking it's bound to make you crazy give your stomach trouble Make your vision hazy Won't somebody tell me how to turn off this brain The journey would be quiet and I'd get there just the same Oh, the journey would be quiet and I'd get there just the same Oh, the journey would be quiet I love that song and I thought we could, I can always use a reminder to not take myself too seriously and I wanted to share that with you um, because it's possible to be mindful and not take yourself too seriously and it's possible to suffer and be happy even at the same time. So um, I thought that song was a good way of sort of making that point. So I hope over the next little time together we all are able to relax enjoy some ease and experiment with um, a little bit of mindfulness and how that can bring us more ease and more relaxation and clarity into our lives. So um, this this no mud, no lotus business, this the art of suffering and transforming it into joy is, is a process and it's a mindfulness process that really has four stages. And I'll tell them to you, Feel free to forget about them as soon as you hear them from me, because tonight we'll be focusing just on the first, which is mindfulness. And I'd really love for you to relax and have an experience rather than try to remember something. <clears throat> so really, the process is being mindful. And of course, when we're mindful of anything, we're mindful of something. And focusing on mindfulness allows us to begin to concentrate on a certain issue. And then we, when we concentrate, it gives us an opportunity to experience some insight about that issue and hence transformation. So 
in four bullet points, that's the process. But as I said, we're going to be focusing on the first one in part because we really don't have time to do the rest, but um, becoming really comfortable, I think, with mindfulness is um, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. Um, and I think I want to share with you a little bit my, about my own experience with it. Um, I, I came across this practice, really, I went to a Buddhist monastery, frankly, because I couldn't find any place else to go to a retreat. I wasn't that interested in Buddhism at the time. And um, they happened to be teaching this practice when I was there for that retreat. And a light bulb went on in my head. Um, it was the first time that I realized that I could experience suffering and happiness at the same time. Um, I, they had always been really mutually exclusive in my head. And um, so it was really a wake up call that they just allow, I started to allow myself that freedom. And I did it because I started to learn and what they taught me was how to manage my suffering. And I had always sort of felt that my suffering to some extent managed me, even if there was an issue or something was up, I thought I had to do something to straighten myself out or figure out what the problem was and correct it. And instead, what I learned was, first of all, to just stop and relax, to stop and take a breath. And I began to learn how important breathing was. And breathing is something that, of course, we all take for granted. We all do it all the time, happily, or we wouldn't be here. But it also is a very wonderful resource and a wonderful tool to help us come home to ourselves, home to our bodies. And unfortunately, because we spend so much time being so busy in this culture, we often are not even in touch with our bodies. So our bodies are running around sort of racing into the future and our minds are trying to catch up and then you have too much thinking is bound to make you crazy. Um, so learning how to stop and breathe and just be is really sort of the first component of mindfulness and is really a wonderfully nourishing practice to begin with. Um, and you can begin with that in a very simple way by just beginning to notice your breath and pausing when you notice your breath. One of the things about the bell is that it, it's called the bell of mindfulness. And in everyday practice, people often will hear a bell and stop, pause and breathe. And then they extend that to the telephone. So the phone rings and before they answer it, they'll stop and pause and breathe. Um, or if you're at a red light, you can use a, a traffic light as, a, as an example of a mindfulness bell, if you will. Um, so there are lots of little things in your daily life that once you start becoming aware of them, you can begin to use as little mindfulness bells to kind of allow yourself that just that moment of pause. And in that moment, you can feel yourself inhale and exhale and just relax and breathe. And as I said, we so often don't allow ourselves that opportunity. Um, and because we're in such a, a living at such a frantic pace. So that's one of the reasons I think we don't really know how to handle our suffering. And because we don't know how to handle our suffering, we tend to cover it up and we tend to cover it up with all sorts of cravings and consumption. Um, we tend to shop more, we tend to work harder. Um, we tend to eat more, we tend to drink more. Um, we tend to go to too many spiritual workshops looking for the answer. Um, we tend to do all those things instead of just stopping and being with what is. So this is really a practice of being with what is. And of course, your breath is and it's readily accessible. So it's a great place to begin. Um, it's a place to begin to learn how to manage your suffering. And then as you learn to work with your suffering, it creates greater space and clarity and freedom for you to really experience happiness and, and expand your sense of happiness and joy in the world. Um, so um, I just, just before I, I came online to um, meet David, I came across a, a quote of Mary Oliver's that I thought was just lovely. Maybe our world will grow kinder eventually. Maybe the desire 
to make something beautiful is the peace of God that is inside each of us. And I just thought that was such a beautiful quote. Um, maybe the desire to create something beautiful is the peace of God inside each of us. And I, I kind of suspect that might be true. And one of the wonderful things that happens with a practice of mindfulness is that you get in touch with that spirit of God within or spirit of the Buddha, the source, whomever that doesn't even have to be a being, but whoever that is for you. Thich Nhat Hanh says that um, nirvana is in the present and the kingdom of God is here and now. So that's certainly possible for each one of us. Um, so, um, as I said, there's, there, the roots of suffering are, um, seem to be many, but they're not quite as multiple as we think they might be. And I'm wondering just from your own experience, if any of you have identified any suffering big or small, have any of you ever suffered at all or experienced a suffering? Just raise your hand so we can get an idea of somebody suffered okay Kate's hands are up double <laughs> and when you're when you are suffering and in that place what does that feel like does it feel like that's the only thing that's there um sometimes it does to me that's for sure so raise your hand again if that's your experience of suffering um it seems to overtake everything and kind of color your world um so and then I don't know about you, how do you try to manage it then? What do you do to deal with it? Um, does anybody want to just unmute themselves and say one word or two words? Or go ahead, Susie. There you go. Um, I usually reach out to either a friend that mm -hmm. I know will listen and not try to solve my problem. Great. Or I, or I might call my spiritual counselor. Thanks. I'm not yeah, sure. I am. Um, Eileen, I'll, uh, I, I um, definitely go outward to my people and um, process. And, uh, but I also, before that happens, I can get really frantic and try to problem solve and think harder. Mm. Thank you. Adds to the suffering. Thanks. Betty, did you want to share? Uh, yes. Um, I, um, if, if it's possible, I go out into nature. I take a, a hike or go kayaking and and uh, feel the healing power of, of uh, my surroundings. Thank you. Anne-Marie, you had your hand up, I think. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, I'm I'm learning and I'm, I'm a beginner, I have to admit, to uh, try and stay with it without running my inclination would be to run away, mm -hmm. to do something else, to distract myself, to blame somebody, whatever. But I'm trying to practice, I'm practicing just to stay with what is, and it's very hard mm -hmm. to say the very least. Well, thank you. Um, and that's a perfect segue into what I wanted to share next, which is that, um, one of the wonderful things I learned was that rather than I used to tend to resist my suffering or to cover it up with food, alcohol, just some sort of consumption, or I deny that it existed. And what I began to learn was that, you know, resistance is persistence and to deny something, um, you can't change what you don't admit or what you don't acknowledge or allow. So, this was a real shift in how to work with suffering, because as I said, I thought the whole point was to fix it. Um, and instead, I was being suggested that I allow it to be as it is in that moment. And using mindfulness, the energy of mindfulness, A, allows you to do that. And it also introduces another energy right away so that your suffering isn't quite as isolated and alone as it was before you stopped and took that breath and noticed your suffering. Um, and then you have the opportunity to invite something else to come into that space, either another quality or a thought 
or an idea to contact someone or however else you might choose to manage it. But it starts to create some space between your suffering and yourself, um, which is really wonderful. Um, and suffering and happiness, um, we tend to think it's either or, and that suffering does not exist with happiness. And in fact, they really coexist and can't exist without each other. They they inter are in, in the Thich Nhat Hanh order, they talk about interbeing of, of all beings and all things, um, but certainly suffering and happiness. It's a little bit like Oh, a, a cloud with rain, you know, the cloud wouldn't exist if there wasn't water and, and to create rain. And yet the rain is what creates the cloud. So it's that sort of circular process that seems to continue. So suffering and happiness coexist. And when you think about it, you really can't have one without the other, because if you didn't have suffering, how would you ever know you were happy? I don't know. Um, so thinking about the mud and the lotus, we can think about the mud as kind of our suffering, obviously. And the lotus as our happiness, our beauty. Um, and it's interesting to sort of explore the mud a little more, more thoroughly because I don't know about you, but I tend to think of mud as kind of yucky and possibly smelly and murky and not particularly attractive. And yet, um, upon further examination, at least with a, with a lotus pond, that mud has absolutely wonderful nutrients and nutritional qualities that make that beauty grow. So out of that murkiness and shadow and yuckiness, something beautiful grows. And that's why I love the metaphor so much. Um, I think it's really rich. So there are lots of different ways to work with our suffering and to use mindfulness to balance out that sense of suffering. And one of them is to, um, in Buddhism, Buddhism, Buddhists talk about store consciousness and it's a kind of consciousness where they believe all qualities and, and all qualities exist and different qualities can be cultivated and throughout our lives, different causes and conditions, uh, you know, childhood conditioning, traumas, etc., might cause some to arise rather than others. Um, seeds of anger, seeds of jealousy, seeds of rage, whatever. Um, and then at the same time, also, we all have the seeds of compassion self-love, kindness, etc. Um, so it's possible to work with that consciousness and bring those positive seeds to the fore. So one of the ways of working with suffering is noticing a suffering and thinking about what an opposite sort of positive quality might be or something that might balance that out and invite that seed into your consciousness and even to begin to practice that. So um, if you were feeling particularly judgmental towards someone, perhaps, um, you might practice some forgiveness in your everyday life or just some quality that you think sort of balances that out. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes um, really doing a guided meditation, exploring those two facets, exploring a little bit of mud and a little bit of a flower the lotus. Um, one of the beautiful things about the lotus and about our own suffering, I think, is that um, the lotus will only grow in mud. It will not grow in potted soil. It will not grow in regular dirt. It won't grow in manure. It will only grow in mud. And I think that's really a very sweet metaphor for each of us and, and the world collectively, because on a certain level, we each have our own story about our mud, and yet it's, on one hand, it's all the same mud, and yet it's very different. So I think it's nice to have our individuality acknowledged even as we're claiming our interbeing with it. I think that's a really beautiful concept. So I invite you to get comfortable, sit in a comfortable position. Sit up straight if you're seated, if you're it's fine if you feel like lying down or whatever position you 
are comfortable in, but just mostly so your energy can move. Um, and just begin by noticing your breath. No need to change anything. Just notice your breath. Maybe notice your chest to your belly rising and falling. Become aware of your body in your chair, your couch. And notice how your body feels, your feet on the floor, your seat in the chair. Are you noticing any tender spots or sensation in your body? And if so, just take a moment and direct your breath to that tight spot or sore spot or sensation in your elbow or your knee. And just begin to notice your breath. Nowhere to go, nothing to do for the next little while other than just breathe. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. And breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. In, out. And your mind may wander, and that's perfectly natural. It's the mind's nature to wander. Just bring it back to focusing on your breath. In, out. In, out. In, out. And notice your body relaxing a bit. Breathing in, breathing out. And now imagine you're in a beautiful pastoral setting someplace, maybe someplace you've been before, someplace you'd like to visit. And in that place, you notice a lotus pond that you walk up to. You notice the beauty of the lotuses and their leaves, the round leaves. And you also notice the darkness of the mud that they're growing in. And as you notice the mud, invite maybe a piece of suffering that you've been working with lately or that comes to mind. And if something comes to mind, just greet it and say hello. No need to work with it now, just acknowledge it. Hello, anger. Hello, sadness. Hello, loss, I see you. And just acknowledge that whatever comes up. And know that you will work with it at another time and express that to the anger, the sadness, the loss, whatever comes up. No, acknowledge that you will not ignore it, but deal with it at another time. And then spend some time looking again at the pond and noticing the lotuses. And imagine into one of those flowers a quality that you might want to bring up, that you might want to cultivate that would sort of counterbalance the suffering you were experiencing. 
If you were experiencing a sense of loss or loneliness, maybe it would be belonging. If you were experiencing anger, maybe it would be peace. Um, whatever seems to come up for you in that moment. And just breathe into that quality and notice it. And as you notice it, as you're there in your lotus, you might want to take a look around at all the other beautiful lotuses that seem to be blooming just as you are in that pond. And imagine and know that whatever those qualities, those positive, beautiful qualities are, are qualities that are a part of you as well. Just enjoy cultivating that whatever quality it was that you came to and enjoy being in the company of those other qualities, those other lotuses. And know that the beauty, your beauty, that quality and all those other qualities are rooted in mud and something that we tend to judge, but actually is providing us such nourishment and transforms something ugly into something quite beautiful. As you're ready, begin to prepare to leave your pond, at least for the time being. And begin to leave your beautiful spot that you picked. And come back to your breath, noticing your breathing again. Noticing how it feels in your body. Noticing where it lands in your body. And as you're ready, come back into the room and feel you're seated in the chair, your seat in the chair, your feet on the floor. And when you're ready, open your eyes and you'll see this beautiful lotus in front of you. And then David will bring us all back into the full screen. Mm. Thanks everyone. Um, I'd like to invite us to share how our experiences were, but I forgot to read two wonderful things to you before the meditation, so I'll read them now. One is a very short poem by this wonderful poet, Rosemary Watola Tromer. Yes, you too, in the mud. You too are holy in this very moment when nothing feels holy. These are the most important moments to trust our own divinity. I think I want to read that again. Yes, you too in the mud. You too are holy in this very moment when nothing, nothing feels holy. These are the most important moments to trust our own divinity. And David White said, inside everyone is a great shout of joy waiting to be born. And I love that. It's a little 
variation on a lotus, but I liked it. And Thich Nhat Hanh has said that we should nurture our happiness or it will die. So that's an important point to remember. So having offered those few quotes, I would love to hear from you if you'd care to share what your experience was like of dipping your toes into mud and mindful, mindfully dipping your toes into mud. How's that? <laughs> Annie L. Hello, um, this was wonderful, thank you. And thank you for the earlier reminder that uh, so it's possible to hold suffering and happiness at the same time. I often forget that. Um, in the meditation, um, well, before you got into the meditation and you were talking about, maybe it was during the meditation, know that you're breathing in and know that you're breathing out. I had heard that yesterday also um, and in Thich Nhat Hanh's voice. So it was interesting that that is coming to me for a second time. That always means for me to pay attention. Um, and yeah, the slowing down so that I'm aware of the breathing in and breathing out is something that I, I definitely need to do. And when um, you were inviting us to sit with a suffering, it is loss that came up for me. And um, and the notion of belonging, when you offered that as a counter to loss, uh, that was really helpful. And it, I, um, I also shared yesterday in the same, after the same person uh, offered the breathing in and breathing out that I just am, am becoming aware of even the subtle ways that I keep myself apart from. And, um, you know, it was a group that everybody else had a book that I just hadn't bought the book yet. So I wasn't really participating. So I finally bought the book and felt much more a part of the thing. And it's just those, even the silly little ways to the much bigger ways um, that, so it was really nice to be reminded that I can meet loss with a reminder of belonging. So thank you. Mm. Thanks, Annie. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. Hmm. Anne Marie. Oh, hi. Um, yes, someone brought up longing, and I think you did as well. And last night I was um, put, well, I was listening to a roomie workshop yeah it was beautiful and um what we're asked to do for the next week because it's a class is to look at our longing <laughs> uh, being aware of our broken hearts and to think about contemplate what what is my our individual longing and um when we did the meditation and the image and I saw the imagery of the lotus. That's what I saw. Well, I didn't expect that. Um, I have an inkling, let's say, that this beautiful flower, lotus flower. I equate it with longing and I equate the longing with the, with the beauty of the flower and the potential that underlies all of it. The seed in the mud, the nutrients in the soil, and then finally the flowering. Um, it's a little bit fuzzy still for me because it's it's a process, obviously. Um, but the longing, I identified as the longing for my true self with my own divinity. And I'm not sure what the tears are about now. Um, I guess I'm tapping into the longing. That's the best I can come up with right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think longing is is such a wonderful topic, and it um, it's obviously part of the word belonging, but it also has so much to do with desire, which is another word and impulse that has has gotten kind of jaded in our culture. And um, I think really it's that impulse toward the divine, toward wholeness that um, often draws us. And so often we say no to it. And it's so important as we try to define our aspiration and who we are in the world and what we're about. And um, it, it's hard to be happy if, you don't allow that longing, that yearning for something. If you don't yearn for beauty, what do you, what do you have? What do you want? You know, there's nothing there. So, um, mazel tov to longing. <laughs> Holly. <laughs> Such beautiful sharing, I really can relate, and I'm so grateful to be with a group of people who are authentic and um, courageous in sharing what their experience is. That's really, really very beautiful for me. Um, I really appreciated the structure of being, of the breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Um, I am somebody who has lived a lifetime at, in, am I doing it right? How long are we supposed to hold the breath in? How long before you let the breath out? How long do you let the breath out, right? And some things that came to me were just like, uh, you know, we don't say, and now I'm going to breathe. And now I'm going to breathe in, and now I'm going to breathe out. You know, it's part of who we are, and I don't question the breath. Just like the lotus flower doesn't judge the mud for being, ugh, your mud. And the mud doesn't go, oh, look at you, you think you're a flower. Because I've put these judgments on myself. Uh, they're, they're just so, and so I've been in a season. I've been in a season of um, extreme, you know, I'm just realizing like, the anger that I have for myself for not being the person that I thought I was supposed to be, not live up to some ideal that I thought I was supposed to have. And really, I'm just mud and flower. And um, it's not about forgiveness because there's nothing to forgive. I'm just being mud and I'm just being a flower. And that really, um, I don't know, you know, I just... Um, the judgments that I put on my busy, busy, busy mind, they're, it's exhausting. But to have this new awareness, I, you know, when, I, when we were there, what came to me was, you know, thank you for what, when, when, I, when Eileen was saying, um, okay, anger, I acknowledge you. I, I know you're there, but I'm going to deal with you later. It was um, very much like... Um, You know, I just, uh, it, it just, I have been so angry at myself. I, I don't really know how to, um, how to explain it, but it gave it space because I'm not supposed to feel angry. And, 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 you know, and this is just one side of it because I have, you know, I have gone through a ton of shit, right? I'm in a season <laughs> and I can find great joy at the same time. So that really is beautiful, but that space of just giving myself a break from judging. And, um, you know, there was a poster my mom and dad got me when I was a little girl, and I didn't know it was a roomy quote, and I've loved it, and it's been with me in my heart. And it's, you are a child of the universe, no less than the stars and the sun, you have a right to be here. Mm -hmm. And somewhere between knowing that in my heart, I got extremely divorced from that which is authentic. So I'm just trying to, you know, get my way back. It's all there for some beautiful reason. Um, well, one last thing I'm gonna say is, I'm, I'm 55 or 56, and when my mom was my age, she was going through a season. I never saw it until this morning. 
And what came to me too, um, you guys can see the mind definitely is a little busy. A lot of things came to me. It's not, it's not <laughs> uncommon. I still have that busy mind. It's not just the song. Um, but I remember her sharing with me that she was in a place of such fear and she turned to her creator, something greater than herself. And she experienced a calm from the deepest, darkest moment of her life that she in that deepest, darkest moment came something more beautiful than she ever could have seen before, right? Mm -hmm. From the mud comes the flower. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think I want the flower without the mud. So thank you very much for letting me be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Hmm. Diane. Thank you, Eileen, for the meditation. Um, the suffering that, that came to me is my habit of overcommitting myself <laughs> and then feeling stretched to a point where I just am either exhausted or overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And the quality, um, the balancing quality that occurred to me was sufficiency. And it came in the form of um, enoughness. Mm -hmm. And the, the phrases, I am enough, mm -hmm. I have enough, I do enough and just allowing myself to rest in that, the experience of enoughness was really, uh, really a balm. Mm. So thank you. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. The, the whole concept of enoughness is really an antidote to the whole compulsion to consume, you know. Um, Betty, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, just, um, I, I work with a, um, a woman who has leukemia. We talk every Friday and we do guided meditations together. And sadly, a few weeks ago, she fell and, and broke her pelvis. Mm. So she's now experiencing uh, pain. It got a little better in the uh, last two weeks. It seems to almost be getting worse. So I, um, when we went into the mud, I, you know, it was her pain that I, I, I felt. And then I was like, well, what's the word <laughs> um, for the, the other side, the, the lotus side? And um, what I came up with actually was mobility. And um, I thought maybe I'd explore that with her tomorrow in terms of looking at mobility, maybe in different ways. Um, I mean, right now she's really struggling to just get from the bed to the bathroom, but um, but it was uh, I thought that would be an interesting thing to ex explore. So thank you. Thank you. you. You piqued my interest because one thing that came to mind for me was different kinds of mobility. It's not all necessarily physical. It could be imaginal. It could be creative. It could be sound. It could be lots of different elements. So thank you for mentioning that. Karen. Hi. Um, my, I would say a lot of my suffering in the past has been f through um, negative self-talk. And I, what I love about this teaching is that the quality of the lotus, that it doesn't allow the mud to, lead, to stay on it. And when I opened my eyes and saw that image that you had on the screen, it reminded me that in that meditative contemplative space, that that's exactly what we're allowing to happen is that all of those stories or self-talk or perceptions they can just fall off like they can there's nothing if we if we are 
present enough to our breath, which is how you invited us, that um, it does, it all falls off. And um, that's what I'm going to walk away from this uh, time with you with, Eileen, is that it's, it's just um, our natural state that it falls off if we allow it to do that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Erin. Yes, and um, that's one of the reasons that I found this practice to be so exciting is that it ended the struggle of trying to let go. I just, I could just breathe and it just sort of happened. Um, and as I said to somebody earlier today, I, I think I met this practice at a point when I had done quite a bit of healing work. Um, it, I well may not have been able to access it earlier, um, but um, but it really opened up a lot in terms of just being a lot, just breathing and allowing with such permission to allow the dropping away, you know? So thank you for mentioning that. Richie from Florida. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Eileen, for, um, for the invitation to join you uh, this evening. Um, I've heard so many wonderful things that, that have uh, kind of reinforced stuff that I've known uh, and experienced. I, um, when you were talking about craving and uh, when I think you were asking about how you experienced that or what do you do? And, you know, in the old days, it was reach for a box of donuts um, instead of um, the positive tools that people were talking about this evening. Um, but I, when something would happen in my life that would be, um, uh, I didn't want to deal with, so I didn't want to see um, my first, inclination was uh, aversion or to try to solve the problem. And um, through, through practice, uh, it's been more of what can this teach me? What can, I, what can I learn and how can I grow from the experience rather than pushing it away? Because I, I know from personal experience that when I practice aversion and try to push things away, it just comes back harder and harder uh, and stronger. Um, so I can't do that any longer. Um, so, but it's, it's all practice, it's all process. And uh, I, I, I'm really glad, uh, like I said, I'm glad you invited me to this time. And it's wonderful to see you um, on the big screen, if you will. Good to see you too, my friend. Anybody else? I know names. No, I'm teasing. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me this evening. I can't believe that our time together is almost up. Um, it kind of flew by for me, um, and I really appreciated you joining me. Um, I, I feel like this is just the beginning of sticking our toes in the water of the mud pond. <laughs> and it really is delightful. Um, so thank you for joining me. And so I'd like to end with a song that is a, a Plum Village, a Thich Nhat Hanh practice song. Um, and these songs, when I first heard them, I, I was insulted because I'm so sophisticated and cool. I was much too sophisticated and cool for this music. And I couldn't believe they were playing such childish songs. And since then, I have come to love these songs <laughs> and really get the incredible beauty in them. So, um, Anyway, I just think you'll, I hope you'll enjoy it. it. To me, it sort of sums up our evening and 
is also again a reminder to just stop and breathe and heal so thank you for joining me and david if you would play that that would be lovely breathing in. everyone many blessings thank you eileen i'm clapping myself <laughs> can't see Great. it oh adele thank you <laughs> thank <laughs> you eileen thanks eileen thank you eileen